Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Scotia Bankers. Good afternoon, customers. Thank you so very much for joining our first economic overview in Cayman, where we'll be giving you the international and local perspective. The format today, we'll have an introduction done by Marcelo, introducing our presenter, Judith, and then we'll have a question and answer session moderated by Novlet, and then I will close off. Feel free to share the link with your friends and family to say, listen, this is some very important information that you need to get. And of course, throughout the presentation, just type in your questions and we will answer them in the Q&A session as, most, as, be as best as we can. So I'm gonna hand over to you now, Marcelo, to do the introduction. Thank you, Tracy, very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marcelo Suarez Castillo, and I am the Director of Asset Management at Scotiabank Trust Cayman. It is my pleasure to introduce Judith Chan, our keynote speaker for today. Judith serves as a portfolio manager for the fund and ETF portfolio solutions distributed through Scotia Funds, which includes the Scotia U.S. Equity Fund and the Scotia Global Equity Fund, both available in the Cayman Islands. Judith is responsible for portfolio construction, asset allocation, and manager selection. Her team is involved in the due diligence and the day-to-day -day management of all portfolio solutions. With more than 15 years in the investment industry, she has held progressive roles in investment management research and portfolio construction. Judith is a Bachelor of Economics from Simon Fraser University at Vancouver, British Columbia, and she is a CFA charter holder. I will now pass it on to Judith. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It, having me. it really is a, my pleasure to be here speaking to you. Um, I, I guess I'll take you through a couple of slides, and through that, um, I'll give you a bit of a, a market and economic update, in which I'll give you more context about where we are in the, in the market, where we are in the economic cycle, uh, what drove market returns in the last little while, and then I'll give you a summary in terms of um, our outlook, as well as portfolio positioning. Um, so in the last couple of years, I think we've had a, a few years of smooth sailing in the markets, um, and that is until recently. Uh, conditions have been a little bit different. We, we're seeing, uh, we're in fact going into a different market environment. Markets have been quite choppy. And then on top of that, we have, uh, we have Russia, who decided to go to war with Ukraine. Um, so the, all of that is a, is, a, is a lot to digest. Um, so let's start with what's most top of mind, which is the war that Russia is waging in Ukraine. So I'm not here to downplay the humanitarian crisis that it's caused. It is an atrocity. Um, but for the next little while in, in this session, we'll be focusing solely on the financial aspect of this invasion. Um, so Russia's invasion in Ukraine has a tremendous negative impact to global economies. And it, it's also adding a high level of uncertainty to financial markets. It may seem like Russia is a small percentage of the equity markets as, as a percentage of total global GDP. It's only 3% of global GDP. And within the market index, the equity index is only 3.3% of the emerging market index. So it, it seems like it's a relatively small country. However, it's the third largest oil producer just behind US and Saudi Arabia. And it's also the, the largest exporter of oil, or the second largest exporter of oil behind Saudi Arabia. So the impact that's coming from uh, Russia uh, because of the energy uh, market is, is actually pretty tremendous. So if we look at Russia as a, as a global energy supplier, it's the, like I said, it's the third largest oil producer and the impact to Europe is particularly large. So if Russia starts exporting uh, oil to Europe in retaliation of the sanction that that the that global markets are placing on the country, it will lead to an oil shortage, and the oil shortage in Europe and Asia will lead to a crisis in the commodity markets. And we expect that to price the energy markets to price in a scarcity value for oil. 
And the rise in oil in oil prices is a strong has a strong negative correlation to manufacturing PMI and global manufacturing activities. So rising oil prices would be a big headwind for global activity. Uh, so what we but what we've seen is that oil price recently came back from a the most recent highs of 125 to 130 dollars after it's been pricing in a significant disaster, basically a scarcity value. Um, but it has come back because, uh, well, we, we expect it to remain high, but the price will be highly sensitive to how the war evolves and what Putin does, which makes it highly unpredictable. Um, and in addition to oil prices, to food and fertilizer prices, are also being uh, are highly impacted. Um, you know, Russia as well as Ukraine are high are key producers of uh, global wheat. Uh, they export a lot of wheat as well as uh, uh, potash, the fer uh, fertilizer. Um, and the production of that, the in the disruption in the production of, of wheat and the exports of wheat, it's it's another driver for rising prices in both wheat and, and other food products, as well as fertilizer. It's a key driver to the inflation that we're seeing right now. Uh, in terms of the export, you know, the, the it's especially negative to countries that are importers of, of those products, namely Egypt, Turkey, um, and especially and uh, you know from, from Ukraine, Indonesia is a, is a lar is the largest importer of Ukrainian um, wheat. So um, another impact, another thing that we were seeing is that global markets or global governments are placing a lot of sanctions on Russia, you know, starting with they boot them from the SWIFT system, which is the global payment system, um, which stopped the functioning of the central bank in terms of supporting the, the currency. So first of all, the, the first impact was that we see a collapse of the rubles. Uh, you, you can see from the chart here, the rubles has been uh, significantly impact. It's down uh, more than 50% at one point. Uh, its interest rate also went up to 20%. So that cripples their financial and credit markets. Um, we expect more corporate bonds, more um, credit issues to default over time as companies are struggling to make coupon payments in US dollars. And afterwards, we see various and numerous global corporation, private listed corporations are leaving the country or are suspending their, their operations, which effectively is putting Russia fully uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Um, what we're also seeing is that, you know, investment funds are exiting their investments in the country. Um, what's also Im impactful is that the index providers are removing Russia from the index, from global equity indices for liquidity as well as um, uh, ESG investment reasons. But besides the war, we can't really blame it, uh, blame everything on the war. Besides the war, oil has, oil price has also been remaining high as the oil markets continue to be in a deficit position with production slightly behind the usage. Um, demand is actually exceeding supply. We're already seeing, uh, you know, companies are or ramping up the production, ramping up the the exploration, but then it will take a while. As you know, this is this area has been lagging behind in terms of the investment into the rigs, so it will take some time before the production will be able to ramp up to meet supply. And eventually, when they ramp up production, it may overshoot supply, um, which is leading to uh, continuous price volatility. So we expect oil prices to continue to be very volatile. One thing to keep in mind is that you know demand has been really strong, um, but we are seeing a weakening sign in terms of the demand for oil. One thing to note is also that you know there are also uh, rising cases in China. China is a big user in terms of energy. If if China goes into lockdown, which is starting to do in certain areas of the country, and that would dampen the demand. And what's also important in terms of uh, the global impact is that it may extend the supply chain disruptions that we've been experiencing throughout the pandemic. So all this is leading to the, the story of inflation. Um, so throughout the pandemic, we've seen lots of things that's impacting duration. You know, we, we've seen supply shortage in, term, in terms of dur uh, durable goods. Um, 
demand has also been very strong and it, and it's uh, demands has been uh, uh, surging uh, in terms of in, during the, the pandemic we've seen people enjoying their the government stimulus checks and the support payments um, we've had very strong markets which creates a bit of a wealth effect housing market has been strong in developed markets and the, uh, the labor markets has been recovering really, really strongly. So all that points to a, a strong um, spending uh, on durable goods and household goods. Um, you know, adding to that is also, you know, wage growth and we're, we stop spending on other things such as travel or other services. Um, but because of the supply chain, as well as kind of labor shortage in, in, the, in the labor market, um, it's it's basically having too much money chasing too few goods um, and it all this points to higher inflation so you know you can see from this chart here inflation has been rising pretty consistently and the main drivers has been uh, first of all energy energy is a key piece and it's a key input cost to lots of goods and services um, and energy itself is a, is a key weight in terms of the inflation uh, uh, index um, other than energy related uh, products, goods, and services. And there's also autos, new cars, used cars, as well as other durable and household goods. We expect we we're not done. We're not over in this trend. We expect this trend to continue as energy prices continue to be high. And like I said, energy prices is is the cost base for uh, most goods, and that will continue to be a key driver for um, um, inflation. We used to have this board called transitory. We, we expect uh, inflation to moderate going forward. But with with energy prices staying high, we expect inflation to remain high uh, for longer to be to be quite persistent. But this is not a um, isolated to certain countries. This is actually a pretty global issue. Um, as you can see here, most developed markets and developing markets are seeing significant rise in inflation and that the trend it continues to go we we have not seen signs for that to ease um, and we expect that to continue to go on um, the exception would be china i think china and japan are the only countries that are not seeing significant spikes in terms of uh, inflation there's uh, there's a lot of reasons for that uh, you know china has um, a, a big cost base in terms of the coal, uh, oil and gas extraction as well, which is actually dampening their um, consumer demand uh, quite a bit. So they also have curbs on in terms of borrowing and the, the spikes in property prices is actually dampening consumer demand uh, quite a bit. So that's actually uh, have a negative impact on their on their inflation count. Um, but not only is inflation impacting um, the market sentiment? What we're what is impacting the market sentiment is actually a real rise in terms of the real uh, yields, um, and that is quite concerning for most investors. Uh, yield, yield, bond yields is a is generally used as a discounting factor in terms of the equity uh, valuation. Um, so this. A rise in the real bond yields have a negative impact in terms of um, the, the valuation of most um, equity markets. What, we, what we've seen is that you know companies that has um, uh, valuation models that's farther further into the future, those are most impacted. So such sectors, such companies would be technology companies. Uh, technologies got impacted the most as they're most sensitive to the rise in the discount rate that is used to value technology companies. So that is a key headwind for equity markets. And we also expect volatility to be higher uh, going forward as well. Um, but we can't blame it all on uh, Putin in terms of the, the equity market drawdown as well as the economic slowdown. We are already seeing a slowdown in the economic uh, trends before the war started. Um, the economies are already set to slow globally. Um, so what we've what we've got, the, you know, the chart that I'm showing you here, the um, as you can see here on the left hand side is showing you the, the business cycle in terms of the manufacturing activities. Most countries, uh, most developed countries are already in the slowdown phase. Um, as you can see here, it's in the bottom right quadrant um, showing that, you know, 
activities are still at an elevated level, but the rate of change is negative. So they're still doing well, they're still manufacturing in an elevated pace, but the, the growth is clearly slowing. The best is clearly behind us. Um, and the, the rate of change in terms of the emerging markets, there's a big divergence, as you can see here. India is still doing well, it's still in the expansion phase. Um, Mexico and Brazil are clearly in the contraction phase already. China is hovering, uh, we see um, hovering between uh, slowdown and contraction, um, and, and that is a key chunk of the emerging market. So the emerging markets is, is pretty much in the same spot. Um, and if you look at the right side, the right hand side of the of the chart shows you the, the trend that we've gone through within the US, within the US. Um, you know, in the huge dip into the contraction was clearly the pandemic, but we've since then seen a, re, a sharp recovery. Um, but that was 2020. And ever since then, we've seen a hovering between, uh, you know, going from a contraction sorry, going from expansion, and then the pace have been slowing down, and we're now going into a slowdown phase. But what, we, what we're seeing is that as we come out of the, um, as the pandemic is becoming more of an endemic, uh, we're seeing a bit of a recovery or what we call the re, a reopening uh, boost. Um, and then we'll see, uh, so it's still hanging in there. Like I, like I said, the activity is still at an elevated level, but it's just not as good as before. But what is um, significant, as I already talked about the inflation issue, you know, the, the central banks are, uh, the role is to manage inflation um, as well. So the elevated level of inflation is actually paving the way uh, for central banks to prepare the market for rate hikes and for other, kind, other measures of quantitative tightening. Um, so we're starting to see a tightening credit conditions. Uh, we're seeing credit spreads widen. Um, the cost of money, the cost of borrowing is increasing. Uh, so uh, we, we expect to see that to continue. So we're in a slowdown phase, but not just in a slowdown, but in a slowdown in a tightening credit condition as, as well. And the war that Putin is raging in Ukraine just moves that slowdown um, timeline forward, um, you know, with the commodity as well as the food price uh, crisis at the, that the war has created. Um, so the impact of this is varied in, in between countries. You know, ex we expect the U.S. to be the most resilient. Um, Powell just gave the market a boost by talking about uh, how resilient uh, the, the or, or saying that the risk of recession is low. Um, uh, personally, I think it's it's blissful ignorance. Um, we'll talk about that in, in more details. The impact to Europe is expected to be more severe. Um, we expect the slowdown to be pretty significant, and it may dip, dip into a recession as it's more impacted by uh, the energy prices. Um, the, a key chunk of the emerging market lies in China. So China is easing somewhat. It's in a different path compared to the developed markets. When the developed markets are easing, they're tightening, and then now it's the reverse. When the most developed central markets are tightening, China is actually easing somewhat. Not massive, um, but the effect of that easing is actually offset by um, a lot of regulatory crackdown, especially on technology companies, um, as well as the real estate industry deleveraging, uh, which is leading to a housing market slump. Um, it's hurting growth and it's hurting innovation. Um, it's also leading to a risk off sentiment. Uh, we've seen uh, just yesterday, we've seen a reverse of that, the market, the 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 government is actually um, publicly being supportive of, of the market and saying that you know the the crackdown needs to be more prepared, more um, predictable. Um, we'll see the effect. Of, we we have to see uh, whether that has a, a material impact going forward. But the rest of the the emerging markets would be in more of a mixed bag, um, and that depends on the, on the individual country, whether they're a user of oil or a producer of oil, um, depends on their terms of trade, whether they're significant, um, uh, whether they're, their export is greater than their imports or the other way around, or the price of their um, imports and exports. Um, they, but with the strength in the US dollars, um, if they have a lot of U.S. nominated debt or U.S. denominated uh, revenue, 
you know, that the balance of that will determine the outlook for each of those individual countries. Um, so we are, as, I, as I'm saying, we're seeing a uh, dwindling or weakening of uh, demand. And you can see here, you know, you know, we've gone through this whole period of the pandemic. Uh, we saw a, you know, dip down because of the pandemic, but we saw a sharp recovery uh, right about summer of last year. And then we were hit by Omicron. Uh, so, you know, at, we, we could have hoped for a reopening boost, um, but now it's more than offset by the rising inflation as well as the outbreak of the war. Um, so what we're also seeing is that disposable income also fell, um, as we're seeing, you know, income, income level rose, capital gains also rose, um, but because, you know, the government support payments have stopped, it, it's leading to the most recent dip in terms of disposable um, income. This is also not um, enough, or the wage gains is not enough to offset the rising cost of living as well, or the, the, the inflation. So we're seeing at the real terms level, the, the, the real disposable income is actually falling. Um, what is also indicative of a slowdown is that, you know, we're also seeing the retail inventory levels uh, being brought back to the pre-pandemic level. So we're, you know, the, which is a pre, is, is an uh, 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 indicator for future manufacturing levels to be weaker than before. But it's not all bad news. <laughs> um, currently, I think this, the job market is really, really strong. The, the unemployment rate is lower than the pre-pandemic level. So consumer spending is con uh, continuing to, to be strong and retail sales momentum is still quite strong. Um, so there's, there's a lot of goods, there's a lot of bad. Um, so the whole, um, in summary, I think we expect uh, the peak, the the you know a, a slight downtrend going forward, as the peak or the best is already behind us. We have enjoyed that strong recovery uh, from after suffering from the pandemic, uh, but we have already kind of reached back to the pre-pandemic level. Um, but I guess going forward, the spending on services is going to exceed, uh, it's going to increase and that offsets a little bit of the uh, decline in terms of spending on goods and durable goods. Um, as we're going, you know, we, our activity level goes up, you know, we're starting to spend more money in hospitality, you know, we go to restaurants, we start traveling, um, etc. So this is uh, showing GDP, real GDP growth adjusted for inflation. Again, this is a, a bit of a lag in terms of the update. This is not reflecting the, this is updated pre-war. So this is not reflecting the rise in energy prices and the, uh, the starting of the war. Um, as I said, you know, the Eurozone and the UK is more vulnerable and more affected by energy prices and the, and the um, turmoil in Europe. So they're more vulnerable to fall into a recession. Um, but, you know, we're, we're expecting US and Canada to be more resilient. Um, but you can still see that, you know, the, the slowdown is forecasted to be quite significant compared to what we've seen in the last year and two, especially 2020. I mean, especially, you know, we had a, we suffered in 2020. 2021 was a big bounce back. And then 2022, we expect to be kind of a reverse of what we've seen in 2021. Um, and in terms of this, uh, in terms of central banks, like I said, the rate heights uh, or, or this global developed market central banks have already paved the way, have already finally telegraphed for the market what they're going to do in terms of rate heights. We, The market is widely expecting a tightening of, of rates, a tightening of financial conditions, and we're expecting um, uh, the, the rate heights. Uh, so the, the rate heights are widely anticipated. So it's not a surprise. Um, what is what is surprising the bond markets in particular is the expectation or or how the central banks are expecting the growth in these various markets to be able to support the the the, the rate heights that they're that they're telegraphing. Um, what we're seeing here, you know, we just had uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve raise rates. We also had overnight uh, last night, Bank of England also raised rates. So none, neither of these 
these are surprising. Uh, but what was surprising is that um, the Fed had a pretty uh, hawkish uh, projection in terms of um, how we expect the, the rate height will be. Um, we're, you know, they're telegraphing, they're signaling that there's going to be five more rate heights um, in, in, in the U.S. And the, and the Bank of England is also uh, being pretty hawkish, saying that there's going to be more five more rate heights till the end of the year. Uh, what's common uh, between those two is that they're both reducing the growth outlook for the rest of the year as well as for the next year. Um, so, you know, as we are, as the global economic slowdown is baked in, the uh, the central banks are relatively behind the curve. As you know, you typically what we're seeing uh, central banks do is that you know the the economy is on an uptrend. So to manage and the inflation, the rising inflation, they would raise rates to combat to manage the inflation. This time around, we're seeing quite a bit of an opposite. They're behind the curve, so we already had that tremendous growth. Inflation is already um, really high, and now they're raising rates in a slowdown as we're going into an economic slowdown. And that is uh, driving, uh, giving the market a little bit of an anxiety. Um, I guess Bank of England is a little bit of a, it's a little bit more dovish, but they're, and they're recognizing, you know, the high commodity prices and how that's going to put pressure on businesses. Um, but, and the war is leading to, you know, more persistently high inflation and lower growth as well. So there, uh, it, all the central banks are very um, data dependent. We, we continue to expect um, the central banks to walk back some of these uh, rate height um, uh, expectations as we, you know, but we need to see evidence that the inflation is coming back down or the economies are not, uh, not strong enough to withstand or to take a rate height. Um, so we continue to expect that and the bond market is actually uh, in agreement with us. As we, as you can see here, bond markets, global bond yields have been very, um, very significantly volatile, and that hasn't been seen for a long time. Um, and it's a reflection of the changing expectation um, between a couple of things. They're very much interconnected um, between the, the, the slowdown. The rate of slowdown is very cons concerning, and because of the war, that rate could be faster than, than most of us expect. The inflation can be more, more persistently high, can remain high for longer um, as you know the energy prices continues to stay high. And then it, the third is, you know, it, it really depends on that geopolitical front, whether that uh, war is going to go uh, um, continue to rage and how much that escalate. If, if we're seeing a contagion, an escalation of that turmoil, um, that impact on the global economy could be higher. So um, the we've seen the gyration and oscillation in terms of the global bond yield going from flight to safety and on one day and then uh, another day there'll be some kind of good news and we've, we've seen a risk asset rally. Um, so we've seen a, a lot of gyrations in terms of the bond yield. Um, but what the central banks have been focusing more on, you know, the, the say the Bank of England, um, they're putting a higher focus on inflation. So it's um, uh, it's it's relatively dovish in terms of their tone, um, the, but the Fed is uh, more hawkish in terms of tone. Um, so we we expect the volatility to continue. Uh, again, it all depends on how persistent is the inflation, how persistent is the high energy prices, and how much consumer demand is affected by high inflation because of the high energy prices. So all these factors are highly interconnected and highly data dependent. Um, and that is creating a lot of the uh, uncertainty and volatility uh, in the markets. So let's talk about how that impacts um, the the various the, the markets um, across the globe as well as across asset classes. Um, as you can see here, we've had a couple of years of strong um, returns, but in recent months, uh, the market has given back uh, a few, uh, a, a quite a bit of the of the previous gains. But in terms of one year returns, uh, the developed markets to continue to have um, pretty strong return. And, and you know, for three and five year return, that remains a little 
made it. Um, but you, if you peel the onion uh, uh, and lay another layer, um, well, before we move on this page, you can see that you can see the difference between the Canadian equity, the U.S. equity, and the developed international equity markets versus um, the emerging market equity. Uh, emerging markets has been has had a pretty big drawdown last year, uh, and it continues to be um, quite negative uh, compared to the rest of the developed uh, markets. And again, if you peel the layer, uh, peel the onion, an, an extra layer, you see that you know in terms of sector, whether it's it's sector, whether it's style, there's a lot of oscillations. There's a lot of changes in terms of leadership. Um, you can see it's a pretty busy chart as the colors are very very uh, messy because there's a lot of changes and and there's no there's no steady um, um, leadership, with the exception of energy because energy it's driven mostly by the energy prices. Um, but what you can see here, for example, uh, I, uh, in November, you see that you know the technology sector has been the lead, and that leadership has changed from uh, since January, and that's the same for um, discretionary. Uh, the energy, uh, you know, it's you know was at the bottom in November, and that leadership has changed since January. So there's a lot of oscillation within the market, um, but although there's a Pretty widespread, pretty broad-based decline in terms of the equities. Um, the market breadth has actually been shrinking. Now, um, only about 44, less than half of the names are still above their 20, uh, their uh, 200 days average. So the the uh, the breadth of the market is actually shrinking, meaning that the divergence or the range of performance between names is actually getting wider. Um, it's not that. Uh, they're not performing the same uh, between names and the fundamental the differences in the quality of the of the name of the company is actually making a difference. So this one um, it's about the same. It just shows global instead of just U.S. But since global it's about more than 60% of the market, um, the trends are pretty close and pretty similar to the U.S. market. But what is uh, what is supporting and what is a positive news for the um, equity market is actually strong corporate earnings. As you can see here, this is the uh, fourth quarter earnings in the U.S. And you can see pretty much across the board, there's been earnings surprise and there's sales surprise. So before the, the release of the quarterly earnings, the the um, growth rates for these companies are already at an elevated level. It's actually pretty rosy. It's pretty pretty good, um, but the the results is actually surpassing that. Um, so in terms of earnings, it's surpassing overall level by six percent. And then in terms of revenue, the revenue is also greater than what the market the growth rate that the market is actually expecting. Um, and so that is actually really positive news uh, uh, for the quarter, for the, for the year of um, 2021, as well as going forward for 2022, the growth rate continues to be, um, to be quite strong. Um, the same goes for global. Um, well, not as strong. Um, U.S. is by far uh, better than the rest of the outside of North American markets. Uh, so, out, so including uh, all the developed markets, including U.S. Earnings is still, you know, at, in line with the expectations, but sales is actually um, um, pretty, pretty significant in terms of the positive surprise. That provides a pretty strong support in terms of the fundamentals uh, of the company performance. But if you look at going forward, um, what is still uh, supportive of the market is actually the forward-looking um, earnings expectation. What we're seeing is that um, you can see here the, the red line is in the U.S. Um, and then U.S. is by far growing faster and growing stronger in terms of earnings compared to the rest of the world outside the U.S. and, and as well as the emerging market. But one thing that's worth highlighting is the uh, divergence. Uh, what we're seeing is that the emerging markets earnings expectation is actually coming down. Um, there's more revisions uh, from, in, from an earnings front. Um, I guess one thing that is driving that is the um, the inflation is already higher. The inflation, the rise in inflation is actually sooner than in the developed markets. Um, and that is already impacting the consumer demand. Um, we, we, we're expecting the weakening to be faster, to be sooner, and to be higher, greater in magnitude compared to um, U.S. Um, EFI, 
uh, in terms of you know that would be the international developed markets outside of U.S. and Canada. Um, that is also uh, relatively stable. It, the growth rates is lagging behind the U.S. Um, but again, this is not yet reflecting the impact of the war. Um, so in Europe, like I like I mentioned already, we're expecting the impact to be more severe. It may dip into uh, recession. Uh, so that earnings expectation is expected to come down as well, which leaves us U.S. U.S. is uh, quite a bit more insulated um, and the impact because of the war, because of the energy prices is less um, compared to Europe. So it's more resilient. We expect, we still expect the weakening to happen, but then, um, and and the, the earnings expectations to come down from here, but the magnitude um, is not expected to be as strong. So we continue to favor uh, US uh, versus the other regions uh, for that for that reason. That was the main reason. So in terms of how we're positioning the portfolios, like I said, there's a there's there's already uh, there's you know always opportunities. There's the bullish stance and bullish uh, factors that puts us in the bullish stance. There's also factors that that requires us to be in a more bearish stance. Um, so these are the main reasons. I think um, we continue to favor um, developed markets, especially in the U.S. Um, over emerging markets. We favor North American over Europe uh, and Asia. Um, but as I already mentioned, these are the key reasons. You know, the, the, the corporate earnings are continue to be strong. We have a very strong labor market. The labor market is recovering very, um, not even, but then they're recovering very well. Um, we continue to expect inflation to moderate. Um, it won't moderate to historical levels, which which is below two percent. We expect um, inflation to moderate to above historical levels, but you know it won't be as low as the two percent uh, before the pandemic. Um, and we still have a reopening, you know, uh, as as the as COVID is becoming endemic, uh, more activities will drive more demand, um, and. Even with higher rate heights, I think the low rate, the, the rates remain low on an absolute basis, uh, and that is still uh, low enough to not choke off growth and consumer demand. Um, so we we continue to have a pretty bullish uh, stance, but of course that is dampened in recent weeks um, since the outbreak of the war because of the turmoil that is created in the energy market in the commodity. Uh, uh, markets. Uh, we are seeing, you know, inflation may persist, uh, inflation will remain higher for longer, and it may not moderate for a little while longer, and that will weaken uh, consumer demand. That, you know, it has a pretty significant uh, strong correlation uh, in terms of, you know, how inflation takes, reduces consumer demand. Um, it also increased producer cost uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing activities as well. Um, and in, we're in a tightening phase. And if the central banks don't um, reduce or walk back their path in terms of tightening, uh, they may be at risk of tightening too far and when the consumer is already in a weakening phase, when the economy is already slowing down. Um, so we continue and you know the market agrees with us as well um, that uh, continue to believe that the, the central banks will walk back some of their, their tightening uh, rhetoric and you know all of that is dependent upon how the war in Ukraine develops um, if that continues to escalate um, if that end up involving NATO that contagion will um, will lead us to maybe change our assumptions going forward. Um, but again, the world is hanging in balance uh, between how far the war go and how much growth and how much demand that destroys and how much growth that, that destroys. Um, so we will we continue to monitor um, and we may, we may um, change our mind going forward. But at this point, uh, we continue to be quite positive and uh, we we don't take extraordinary risk. We, we remain slightly um, bullish and slightly overweight to risk assets um, from an asset mix standpoint. Uh, but what within that, I think what we're trying to do 
we said we wanted to rotate, we want to focus into high quality assets, uh, companies with sustainable earnings growth, uh, visible um, earnings growth. Um, we want to rotate out of high beta, high momentum areas into more defendable uh, companies with defendable market leadership. Um, those companies tend to be more resilient to economic slowdown. Um, they're more staples like more high qu high quality, uh, maybe a little bit more into dividend paying names. Um, so the market valuations have corrected and they are currently uh, they are reflecting somewhat into the slowdown. Uh, but I think the earnings estimates have not are not reflecting that as yet. Um, so it may have some more volatility that we need to experience uh, and and, but overall, in general terms, we are continuing to be um, a little bit more bullish and overweight in on risk assets. Um, so that's as much as I have prepared. I will send it back to uh, Novelin uh, to see if there's any questions that you, that you may have. Thank you so Thank much, you so Judith, much, for Judith, that, for that uh, uh, very, very insightful and, and informative, informative presentation. presentation. Um, we do have a few questions coming from the floor for you. So here goes. What advice would you give to investors during the period of heightened economic volatility? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, all of us are humans. We don't like <laughs> market downturn. Um, but one thing for sure is that, you know, we we cannot time the market. You know, uh, market goes through ups and downs. It always overshoot um, in both on both sides, whether it's bullish or bearish. Um, what we need to do is to tune out the noise. Um, in you know, the the news is very hard to hear. It, there's a lot. It but you know, in terms of war, historically speaking, we've learned from history that. Wars are typically short term and have very short term impact to the market. The market is mainly driven by economic and corporate fundamentals. Um, so if we can tune out this noise and not run for the fences, um, you know, it, we we can we need to stay invested. Missing the rebound is actually the most painful. Um, we cannot time the bottom, we cannot time the top. Uh, we, but what we know is that if you stay invested and, and remain in the in the markets, um, you know, the long term, the long term returns is is very to that, that is very um, important to reap the long term returns. Thank you so much. As, as a follow up to that um, question, with the increased volatility in markets and uh, many portfolios are in a negative territory so far this year, what recommendations in terms of portfolio changes would you provide to our clients given the current environment? Yeah, um, what I would review is, that, is to make sure that the, port the portfolio, your portfolio remains very high quality. Like I said, you know, we are rotating and making sure that our investments are focusing on high quality companies with visible um, earnings ability and visible market leadership. We don't want to be in high risk names that are not generating earnings or they only have high earnings prospect without already getting uh, making earnings. Um, so a lot of that a lot of those companies with no earnings but um, are COVID beneficiaries, you know, where the demand has is benefited from the COVID, um, they, those have been given, those are given back uh, to the market. And the going forward outlook is actually less um, bullish for those companies. So I would stick to high quality um, companies with market leadership in their industry with stable earnings and, um, and, and earnings growth uh, in an economic downturn. Just make sure that you don't run for the fences. Uh, we need equity exposures as the best inflation hedge. Um, at, right at this point when inflation is so high, cash is a big drag on the portfolio. Uh, we need to stay in, invested in equities um, as an inflation hedge. But we also need some fixed income to lower the overall uh, volatility of the portfolio. So stay invested, make sure that you have the right risk tolerance and your portfolio um, is according to plan. Your risk tolerance shouldn't be changing because of the market. And if you have the right plan, if you have the right asset mix, 
asset allocation in place, then stick with the plan. Thank you again. Um, can you say where we are currently in terms of market valuation prior to where we were um, before the pandemic? Yeah, um, if you, it, it's back to the same valuation uh, as before the pandemic. So, you know, pretend that, you know, at the beginning and the onset of the pandemic, you had a coma, you suffer from an accident, you went into a coma and you just woke up uh, this past week. The market would be in the same place as when you went into the coma. <laughs> um, so for a lot of the markets, it's, it's about that, um, especially in Europe. Uh, I guess in the U.S. is slightly higher. Uh, the index is at a higher level and the earnings is at a higher level as well. So the, the valuation is the same level. Um, NASDAQ, you know, the technology companies are, are it, it's a different story. So NASDAQ is still by far um, richer in terms of valuation. Um, but a lot of the European markets, it's about the same level in terms of um, valuation level. Uh, but the earnings has gone up. The um, the index level has gone up, the overall valuation level is actually relatively stable. So the valuation is not demanding per se. Um, they're actually at around uh, the five year average level in terms of valuation. Um, US is at a premium and that premium is actually expanding. Uh, you know, while the global, uh, the European market is at around 12, 11, 12 times, US is at around 17 times forward, forward looking earnings. Um, so it, it's not demanding, but in terms of, you know, where we see them going forward, like I said, you know, the world is hanging in balance between the war and the central banks. Uh, bond yields is not quite pricing in inflation and the tightening of, of uh, or the rate heights. Uh, it's only now starting to price that in. Uh, the earnings estimates, it's also a little bit too optimistic. We expect downward revision if oil price remain high. Um, so we continue to see earnings. Um, we can continue. We should expect to see volatility to continue in terms of equity and bond markets. Um, and the going forward, it's more about security selection. We really need to stay in high quality defensive equity. Um, we cannot afford to be not invested as the inflation rate is so high, um, but we really want to invest in companies and focus on companies with um, strong earnings, uh, a resilient market leadership position in order to um, be more resilient to a market, a market downturn. Thank you so much. Um, in a rising rate environment, what are the biggest risk investors face in their portfolio? Um, I guess, you know, when rates rise, the bond yields are rising. Uh, which may lead to negative returns in bond portfolios, um, as well as equity markets, equity portfolios as well. And that reduces the ability for fixed income to offset the equity downside, which, which is what typically happens in a balanced portfolio. But with higher bond yields, um, the long-term return expectation for bonds actually have risen. Um, it actually is, you know, our long-term return expectation for a balanced portfolio is actually better than say six or nine months ago. Um, it helps all the balanced portfolio. So in a in a high inflation environment, as I said, we can't afford to stay out of the market. We can't stay, we can't afford to be in cash because of such high inflation. Um, so what we need to do, um, the, the biggest risk is actually to be out of the market. <laughs> we need to uh, remain invested and to focus on High, um, strong companies with physical earnings uh, to be resilient to a downturn and and the high inflation and the rising rate environment. Thank you. Another question uh, coming from the floor is that should we be investing in China at this time? <laughs> uh, so China, China is an interesting. Uh, story, like I said, it's it's behaving very differently compared to the developed markets. Um, the market is relatively immature. It has a lot of uh, retail. Uh, it's very retail investment and news sentiment driven. 
Um, so volatility will continue to be high. Um, but the most recent concern, which is which continues to be concerning, is actually the regulatory crackdown uh, on the technology company. Um, that crackdown is expected to continue. Uh, and that will spread to other sectors as well. We've seen crackdowns in um, technology, education technology companies. We've seen crackdown in, in all kinds of different uh, high growth technology company that, so this kind of crackdown hurts innovation as well as long-term growth of these companies. Um, what's also concerning is that um, as um, the real estate uh, the real estate sector has been a strong growth driver for China and the the leveraging of these companies because of a, a recent blow up of a of real estate uh, debt issue, um, we expect the housing housing market to continue to struggle and until that is delivered del de deliver to a certain point, uh, the housing market will continue to struggle. Um, so that takes down the growth expectation in the near term, um, only to be off somewhat offset and softened by the stimulus that's provided by the central government, by the central bank uh, of China. Uh, so that easing will take off a little bit of pain, but uh, it, the country continues to be a strong, a large user of energy and the energy prices and the you know, coal prices and other commodity, high commodity prices is going to continue to pressure the country. Um, so uh, the country, you know, it, it's still growing faster than developed markets, but we should expect the um, growth rate to be uh, somewhat moderated uh, from this point onwards. Thanks. Do you see our uh, prices continuing to rise, um, such as food and, and gas? Uh, I think I think oil, the oil market is interesting, um, as already covered in the in the remarks. The production is lagging behind demand, uh, so we expect that that supply deficit. Uh, to continue to continue to uh, drive energy prices higher, um, but depend you know depending on the region, the European market is more impacted um, than and so so Brent prices may stay higher uh, than maybe WTI, uh, you know because Brent needs to needs to factor in higher transportation costs, higher shipping costs um, to source the the deficit of, of energy. So um, yes, energy prices is expected to, to remain high. It may, it may not stay as high as the current levels. It may moderate a little bit, but it will remain higher than you know at the beginning of the year. Um, in terms of food prices, food prices is um, it we expect it to be higher and a, and a bigger piece and a bigger driver for future inflation as well. Um, I think you know, as you know, global climate change is driving um, a lot of natural disasters as well. We've seen flooding, we've seen drought, and now adding onto, uh, and wildfires as well. Uh, a lot of that farmland is, is impacted. Um, outside of global climate change, the uh, disruption in Russia and Ukraine, that is, that is expected to cause um, food prices to rise, especially in parts of Asia as well as parts of um, the Middle East. Uh, so that is going to be a main driver for um, inflation in those regions. Thank you. One final question I see coming from the floor. It says, um, is now a good time to invest and what's your recommendation? <laughs> um, like I said, you know, it's always a good time to invest. <laughs> um, as we're long-term investors, and especially when inflation is so high, when if you're looking for an inflation hedge to maintain your purchasing power, we cannot afford not to invest in when the inflation is so high. Um, I know that it's uncomfortable when we see you know inflation and you know debt and market coming down, um, but when you look longer term, it's still worthwhile to take the risk. It's still worthwhile to make sure that you're you, you that you remain invested. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Uh, that's being the final question, Tracy. It's over to you. Thank you so much, Navlet.
Judith, I learned a lot. I made a couple of notes. So let me do a like short recap. So of course, you started out the presentation talking about Russia and Ukraine, and we do empathize with these families that are like struggling to survive and really just um we want to just end the war. And while we understand the humanitarian aspect of it, it really also does affect many economies. You did highlight the fact that uh, Russia is the third largest oil producer. And you can see from a consumer perspective where oil is concerned, you go to the gas station, the prices are ridiculous. Um, in Jamaica, we're acutely saying, OK, maybe now we need to start riding bicycles to work <laughs> so, because the prices are like so high. You spoke about um, inflation being high, labor markets somewhat leveling off, the housing market is also increasing as well. And our we're in a slowdown phase now, and the countries that are in the slowdown phase is China, US, Canada, UK, France, Italy, and Germany. See, I told you I made notes. <laughs> and um, in the expansion phase is Japan and India and the emerging markets. You constantly stress to focus on the companies with strong earnings and you said remain invested and focus on long term investments. So from that, I thought, OK, you're not advising anybody to do anything short term and not to be quick to make a big decision just because of what's going on with the war. And there we must find a balance between war and growth. So I understood that once the war continues, it's highly unlikely that we are going to see ourselves in a growth position. So that's my summary. When you, you then spoke about the opportunities for portfolios, which is strong corporate earnings, inflation to be moderated, the reopening demand, and you mentioned the hotel industry, restaurants, persons are flying again. And so that means that there's money pumping in the economy slowly but surely, but it's coming in. So persons are now not because of COVID, they don't really want to be going out. They're actually going out slowly, right? And we find also that there are many countries as well that are encouraging persons to say, it's okay now, you can take off your mask. So slowly getting back to that stage of normalcy or what we, we consider the new norm, I would say. And then where there's a threat is the persistence of inflation, the weakening demand, the central banks are over, over tightening and co the contagion of the geopolitical turmoil. So in closing, you're saying to us long-term investments. You're saying to us, watch the war, but don't make a quick decision and focus on the companies that have strong earnings. I want to thank you, Judith, for your presentation. It was very enlightening. It was at a good pace. I understood it. So I was just like, yeah, I can understand with certain things, especially with the oil prices and food. We spoke about food as well. So it's a ripple effect because oil is part of production as well. So if your raw material is very high, then of course your output is going to be also high as well. So if my raw material, which is whatever it takes to make flour, whatever, which you know you have to use oil to pump that production, then chances are the cost of flour is going to be more. And flour is one of the materials that make bread. So it's all a ripple effect pretty much. So thank you so much, Judith. It was an excellent, enlightening presentation. I want to thank Marcella who introduced you to us and Novlet for doing the question and answer session. To all our customers, to all our staff members, we close on this, continue to be safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. bye.